But this week, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Phoebe Zarnetsky. And Dr. Zarnetsky is an associate professor at the Department of Integrated Biology um, and the PI of the Spatial and Community Ecology Lab at Michigan State University. And I have uh, been aware of, of Dr. Zarnetsky's work for a while now, as she has been emerging as a leader and expert in macrosystems biology. Um, and, and she's gonna tell us a lot about that today. So I won't, I won't try to, uh, to define it all for you, but, but she's doing really cool work thinking about how ecological systems and ecosystem functions scale across individual, you know, across broad spatial scales from individuals um, and, and up to continents and, and real earth kind of systems. So I really look forward to hearing her talk today. Let me remind you all, please, if you have any logistical uh, questions or concerns, please put those in the chat which is one of the tabs down at the bottom. If you are new to our series or want to tell us about where you're coming in from, if it's somewhere more exciting than you know, Dutchess County, New York, please go ahead and put that in the chat as well. We love to hear that. If you have questions for Dr. Zarnetsky, either during her talk or just after her talk, please add those to the Q&A tab, which is also down at the bottom. Um, at the end of her talk, I will moderate those questions from the Q&A tab. Um, and, and we will try to address them all or, or put you in touch as time allows. So it looks like we are slowing down on entries from the waiting room. Um, and with that, I will pass it over. Well, thanks Shannon very much. And thanks to everyone for the invitation to, to take part in this series. I'm really excited to share some research with you. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here. All right, and can everyone see that? My mouse moving, all right, great, thanks. Okay, so I'm gonna get started. And yeah, today I'm gonna to be talking about some research that I'm doing and uh, with a lot of collaborators. So I wanna make sure to acknowledge them as well. And they're listed down here at the bottom. Um, but this work really focuses on trying to understand um, and explain patterns of biodiversity across different spatial scales with traits, geodiversity, and disturbance. So first, let's think about what biodiversity is. Well, one of the major definitions that we think of is the diversity between species or the total number of species. And that's really the most common definition that you'll see in the literature. It's also the most common definition that's applied to conservation. And so here's just three maps showing uh, the species richness, the number of individual species at a given place and time for birds, mammals, and amphibians across Central and South America. And what you'll notice is that these maps are different, but there are also some places where they coincide, where there is high biodiversity in all of these different taxonomic groups. But stepping back a bit, it's maybe better to think of a more inclusive definition of biodiversity, and that would be the variation of life on Earth. So biodiversity can be described as multiple dimensions. It can be the diversity within species, the diversity between species, and even the diversity of different types of ecosystems. And we know that biodiversity is essential and unfortunately we're losing it fast. A uh, recent uh, report released by experts uh, in biodiversity science estimates that 1 million species are at risk of extinction, and that's out of about 8 million known species. Some scientists think there may be as many as 11 or even 13 million species out there and we haven't even categorized them or found them yet. So this could be a low estimate. And these species and biodiversity as a whole are really important for providing aspects of natural resources, um, benefits to humans like medicine and food and recreation, but they're also being threatened um, at, at a great degree and an increasing rate. Some of those threats are shown here. These are some of the, the main threats that are impacting uh, biodiversity and, and contributing to its loss. And importantly, it's, it's uh, important to note that these threats are not acting individually, they're acting in a synergistic manner. And so there's not just one impact impacting a given set of uh, species in a place and time, but they're interacting together. So for example, this uh, image here on the left of the um, recent fires in Brazil, 
uh, is an example of how climate change, but also habitat degradation and habitat land conversion can actually um, be caught up in, in sort of a cycle. So, you know, by, by burning um, and, and having these forest fires that can contribute to local uh, changes in the climate itself. Also, because we know the Amazon in particular is very important in the global cycle of climate. Um, this is having a larger and more global impact. So there are these sort of positive feedbacks of the, the effects uh, of these different um, causes of declines. And one of the main threats that motivates a lot of my work is climate change. And some of you have maybe seen this type of diagram before showing global mean temperature from historical measurements A and then potentially into the future, depending on the types of scenarios we might be experiencing. These RCP or represent concentration pathways represent the amount of greenhouse gases that would be in the uh, atmosphere and then contributing to global warming in, in an increased manner. And so depending on how we decide to curb our emissions, we may be looking at these very different futures. So these are potential scenarios in the future of anthropogenic climate change. One option that has been discussed, but is not going, is not actually being implemented right now is climate intervention. Given the fast pace of climate change that's going on and the inability so far to curb our emissions, scientists and other, others have been considering uh, what we could do at, in terms of geoengineering. And this is a very scary uh, uh, sort of set of circumstances that we, that we may be faced with. A recent report that was actually released last week by the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine here in the US um, really kind of delves into this topic and tries to understand where the knowledge gaps are, what kind of research would need to be done to actually understand especially what the potential impacts would be. But what's really largely missing from understanding these potential impacts of, of uh, solar geoengineering, for example, are any, is really any knowledge of the impacts on ecology. So what are these ecological impacts? And a group that I'm co-leading with Jessica Gurevich and actually that uh, Peter Grofman here at the Curie Institute is part of as well, is this climate intervention biology working group. And we are meeting together, have been meeting together for the last year remotely to really discuss and try and understand what these potential impacts might be, identifying the knowledge gaps and where the research needs to happen to be able to understand and quantify these potential impacts. We're really at the very beginning of being able to understand what this might look like in the future. And um, check out PNAS next week uh, because we have an article coming out, a perspective article on this very topic. And so if we were to look at a scenario in the future, this is sort of the worst case scenario, the business as usual scenario here on the left, where we might see concentrations of CO2 upwards of 1100 parts per million, we see a really warmed uh, system, a warmed planet. If we were to implement some kind of solar uh, radiation management or solar radiation modification scenario, we might be able to reduce the temperature on our surface, but it would have very different effects depending on where you would be. And so the climate scientists are really ahead, ahead of the game in sort of understanding what these potential scenarios might mean uh, for the climate, but again, the ecological impacts are essentially unknown at this stage. Um, you can see from this diagram here that you may get differences in terms of where the temperature might be reduced, um, how much it would be reduced. And temperature isn't the only thing that would change. There's differences in terms of impacts, uh, for example, on acid rain increases. Um, this kind of implementation would not actually do anything to curb any of the, the rising ocean acidification, for example. And so there are these major changes that could potentially impact much of the life on earth, um, which would both affect biodiversity, but also the services and functions that biodiversity provides. So as ecologists like myself, we're really interested in trying to understand what the potential future in terms of the climate might do to impact species, ecological communities and biodiversity, whether or not this kind of implementation would occur. Um, and associated with that, how would these functions and services actually change um, and, and, and then affect, of course, humans as well? And this kind of assessment, this, this forecasting, this, this modeling that we would do to anticipate these changes is really necessary because we need to be providing the best available science 
which would include impact assessments and which would include um, estimates of range contractions or extensions uh, for certain species because we need to be able to conserve biodiversity and the functions it provides. So habitat assessments are done uh, very routinely by groups like the IUCN and, and uh, through informing the Endangered Species Act. These assessments can also be done to identify potential areas for creating new reserves, um, creating areas that need to be connected because we know that the climate will be changing a certain direction or another. So it's a really important um, effort to, to be a part of and to really improve the robustness of these models to, to be able to provide the best available recommendations. But stepping back a bit, in order to even do that, the, in, the sort of way that, that biodiversity responds to these changes and the way that we understand the drivers of biodiversity is inherently scale dependent. Organisms are interacting with their environment in very different ways on different time scales and different spatial scales. And collectively then, there's a very different type of response that you might observe uh, depending on the types of taxonomic groups you might look at. Um, or the regions of the world you might be interested in. And of course, then the scenarios in the future for climate and, and land use changes. So in my lab, we take a really um, sort of multi-scaled approach to this question and this, this challenge. We work across spatial scales from local to global scales. We work across time scales from minutes to centuries to try and really grapple with the, uh, all of these different potential responses we might be observing and understanding inherently what might be causing them. And so on this end, uh, or to this end, we, we really kind of combine our interest in experimentation where we can try and get the mechanisms or the processes that might be underlying uh, biodiversity responses to changes. And then we also link that up with observed patterns we observe you know, at these broader spatial and, and coarser temporal scales. And really we see this as a, as a dynamic kind of feedback. We look at these patterns, we try to infer a process, we design experiments to try and test those hypotheses about what may be driving the patterns we observe. And it's a constant cycle and a, and a feedback that we, um, we work with. And so while I'm not gonna talk a lot today about the experimental work that we're doing, I did wanna mention that we have some great experiments going on, uh, especially at the Kellogg Biological Station here at Michigan State University. This is also an LTER site. And um, these experiments are really focused on understanding what the direct and indirect effects are of climate change. And what I mean by that is that every organism out there is experiencing direct effects of climate change, but through their interactions with other species, they're experiencing and then influencing these indirect effects of climate change. So a lot of the work that we do focuses on um, aspects of temperature and how it drives thermal responses to organisms. Uh, for example, warmer temperatures tend to increase metabolic demands in ectotherms, especially insects, and that can increase their consumption rates. So when you think about a whole entire community of insects or even just two interacting, those direct effects of temperature can sort of exacerbate, for example, the predator-prey relationships between two aquatic insect uh, predators and their prey. Same with terrestrial insects and plants, the consumption rates in some cases may increase with global warming. So we have designed a lot of experiments to try and test this. And overall, our kind of focus uh, and sort of conceptual framework for addressing these questions uh, focuses on identifying biotic multipliers of climate change. Are there certain species or certain trophic levels or certain types of organisms that may actually amplify the effects of climate change through their interactions with other species? And by amplifying their effects, that could mean uh, affecting the population size of another set of species, or it could mean influencing uh, primary productivity, for example. So when we zoom out and we look at those patterns across these broader spatial scales, we're no longer relying on the experimental approaches because that, those are very local um, and, uh, and or potentially distributed experiments across different places but the actual experimental design and, and footprint is quite small. So we need to zoom out and then look at the patterns that we observe across really broad spatial and temporal scales. And for that, we rely on data that's publicly available. A lot of these data come from systematic surveys that uh, scientists and agencies would, would conduct, but a lot of it also comes from citizen scientists as well as uh, museum records. <clears throat> 
NEON, the National Ecological Observatory Network, is one example of the type of publicly available data that we use quite a bit in my lab. And this, if you're not familiar with NEON, the, it's an NSF funded project that's set to run for 30 years into the future. And last year was its first complete uh, first kind of year where all of the sites uh, were complete and the data was starting to be collected. Um, of course, the pandemic um, had an effect on that as well. Um, but a lot of those data are continuing to be collected and, and they were able to get out some survey teams into the field. So NEON is set across the, the United States and used 20 different climate domains as shown here in the upper right. And in each of these domains, there are different sites and within each site, there are different plots and different stream reaches and different locations where the same type of data is collected the same. And this is really a gold mine for a lot of scientists because when we try to amass data from many different locations, it's often collected in very different ways with different instrumentation. And so then there's a lot of error that's introduced and we have to deal with that in analysis. NEON is set from kind of the top down, which also has its limitations, of course, in that it can't measure everything all, everywhere and be you know, very adaptive to changes, but there's a lot of data that we can use pretty effectively. So in, in total, there's 81 sites across NEON, and then each of those sites then measure um, observations of organisms, but also aspects of the climate um, and soil composition. So there's abiotic and biotic variables that are measured continuously. Um, in addition, there's also um, airborne and satellite remotely sensed uh, imagery that's provided as well. So using NEON, we can start to look at some of these variations that we might observe at these broader spatial scales and then try to infer what the processes underlying them might be or what the drivers of biodiversity might be. And to do this, it's important to recognize that across space, time, and by taxonomic group, biodiversity is going to really vary. So here's an example of for small mammals in NEON uh, across the lower 48. And you'll see here in the background map of um, range maps, basically they're stacked up on top of each other to show what species richness is expected to be uh, based on independent data. The point locations, this little circles are showing the different types of NEON sites and the, the actual species richness that's shown in each of those areas. But there's multiple taxonomic groups that are, that are collected by NEON. So then we can start to look at the variation among these different groups as well. Um, and each of those groups is gonna have a different pattern of biodiversity if you start to map that across um, the same region. So for trees, it looks like this. And for passerine birds, it looks like this. So already you can see that the vision or the, the what's being shown for biodiversity patterns is quite different depending on the taxonomic group you're looking at. And also note that within each uh, neon site, there's also variation. There's multiple plots set up. And so you might find species richness varying from one plot to another. And so there's these different spatial scales of variation that we can start to tease apart. So it's also important to remember that biodiversity is multidimensional. I just showed you a map of species richness, which is the total number of species in a given place and time. But let's say we wanted to go out and look at multiple sites. So for example, this could be multiple plots within a neon site. We would have maybe site A, B, and C here shown for these different passerine birds that we might uh, be looking at. And we can make then a map of alpha diversity or site level diversity for species richness. And this map I'm showing you is created from the North American Breeding Bird Survey, just as an example. So that's the most common type of diversity, species richness, as I mentioned in the beginning, but it's really just one dimension to consider. What if we wanted to look at the turnover or the difference between sites, which tells us something about how dissimilar each of the sites are to each other. We could then make a map of beta diversity. We could add up all of the individual sites, all the alpha diversity to get gamma diversity. And again, we're looking now at a different map. So what you're seeing here are three different depictions of taxonomic richness as aggregated in different ways. But there are more dimensions of diversity. So two other common ones that we think about a lot are phylogenetic diversity or how uh, evolutionarily distinct species are uh, in the community. Um, but also functional diversity. What's the range of functions or morphological traits uh, and physiological traits that these species um, have 
instead of thinking about the identity of the species, thinking about the identity of the traits that they possess. And therefore, that maps pretty well to the roles that those species might play in the environment. So again, you can start to make for alpha diversity, um, phylogenetic and functional diversity, you can start to make these maps. And then if you fill out the whole matrix, you get all these different maps. And what I want to just mention here is that these are different. They're, they're representing different dimensions of diversity. We can then look at trees and we're looking at a very different picture as well. That these are data from the US Forest Service uh, Forest Inventory and Analysis Program. And again, you're looking at these different maps. They're showing different patterns of diversity from the birds and then um, across these different types of dimensions. And so what I, a lot of uh, recent research has been showing that conservation really needs to focus on these different dimensions of diversity, not just relying on species richness. Um, really nice visual example of why that's important. It is different depending on the type of dimension that you look at. And so depending on how we're identifying targeted areas or targeted um, taxonomic groups for conservation, uh, we need to be talking the same language in terms of the types of, di of diversity that we're actually quantifying. And maybe one way to do this is to look at ensemble approaches or areas where all these different types of diversity are considered at once, and maybe identifying the, the areas that have highest diversity in multiple dimensions would be a way forward in identifying you know, really uh, high diversity locations. So one drawback though to this is that it's actually quite difficult to get a lot of these data. It's more easy to quantify just the number of species in a given place and time than it is to get a handle on phylogenetic and functional diversity. Um, so those data, the phylogenies and the traits are gonna be, be really varying in terms of their availability by taxonomic group, but also in terms of region around the world. So we're doing pretty well, I would say, in terms of having phylogenies and, and traits for birds, mammals, and trees. But there's other taxa, lots of other taxa that we care about. For example, freshwater insects. We know very little about the functional diversity and phylogenetic relatedness of these species compared with these other taxonomic groups I just mentioned. So to help fill in the gaps, um, I've been working with my former uh, PhD student, Laura Tortoclub, and we worked on this um, compiling basically a trait database for the uh, lower 48 United States for freshwater invertebrates. And uh, we produced this paper uh, recently, which uh, basically presents this new database. And I just want to kind of show you a diagram of what's involved in creating one of these databases um, that then becomes publicly available. Certainly there's other data that exists out there. We didn't go out and measure all of these organisms. In fact, we compiled the data from many different sources. And some of that is already in an electronic form, but a lot of it is still buried in reference books. Um, and so Laura and, and an undergraduate student, Ethan Hiltner, went through uh, and really poured over these records and came up with a really systematic way to compile all of these, these sources together, then digitize them, and then clean those data to make sure that they're harmonized. There's taxonomic harmonization as well. Species names change through time as we find out how, uh, how they change in terms of their uh, relatedness to each other. Um, and then finally, there are traits that are just not known. They're just not in the literature or not recorded for certain species. But we can use fuzzy coding, which is a, a method of actually inferring what a likely trait would be or trait value would be based on relatedness, uh, the phyl phylogeny, um, of these species or, or how they relate to other functional traits. And so this database represents both raw data that's, that's compiled and harmonized from these different sources, but also some traits that have been fuzzy coded to, to basically anticipate what the likely trait would be uh, for some missing taxa. So in all, we added um, about a thousand stream genera um, harmonized over 2 million occurrence records for 932 genera of major freshwater insects. And um, this was across about uh, 51,000 streams and rivers in the lower 48. So I encourage you to check it out. If you're interested, it's also available on the Environmental Data Initiative data portal. So let's say we have those data and we're ready to go and we wanna actual, actually model biodiversity in these different dimensions. 
Um, what we might want to do is, is take an approach that's used pretty, uh, pretty um, systematically now in conservation, which is to generate a species distribution model. And essentially, this is a map uh, as an end result um, of a model that's describing the relationship between species locations and their environment. And to get those environmental data, we need to use some information that's out there in the landscape. And fortunately, satellite remotely sensed data is becoming more and more available and at higher and higher resolutions. And so these, this really provides a goldmine of information that we can leverage to create these models. And some of you uh, are probably familiar with how these models work. In general, you have occurrence records, which is just shown here for an example in Australia, these gray dots where you might find a species and say it is here, uh, it has a GPS location associated with it. You then intersect uh, the location of those records with satellite imagery, so things like temperature, rotation, then which is a model, it could be a very simple model, or it could be complex, it could be a machine learning approach, for example. And then you can predict the current distribution, or if you want to increase some of the values in um, those predictor variables. So, if, so for example, temperature and precipitation based on a climate change scenario, you can predict the future uh, distribution. But these are really models. It's important to remember that looking at a map does not mean it's truth. It is essentially a model. It's a, it's a version of the truth. Um, and it's all related to how the model works and the assumptions that go in. And unfortunately, most of these models that are employed these days uh, with this approach are quite simplistic. They're relying on the fact that the relationship between the species and its environment is constant, it's static, it's not going to change into the future. And we know that that's not true. Species evolve, they have local adaptation, there's a lot of um, different factors involved. Also, the unique spatial scales of, of environmental variables that are driving the, the patterns of distributions that we see are usually not taken into account. They're usually one scale. Rarely is there an approach that would look at multiple, investigating multiple different spatial scales of these drivers. Also, uh, different dimensions of biodiversity are still uh, lacking in the literature in terms of these models. Um, mostly it's species richness that's, that's produced. And then also interactions among species are rarely considered. We know that mutualisms and competition and predation are inherently important aspects of species biology that really translate to why we see certain species in certain locations and certain times. And um, the lack of incorporating this information is, is a problem in many cases. Um, a lot of these models are correlative and so they're not incorporating those more dynamic processes. So there's a lot more work to be done in this area as well. So if we wanted to sort of zoom out and think again about this pattern of biodiversity that we're seeing and, and ask what is driving biodiversity patterns across larger or broader spatial scales. One of the most common relationships that we think of is the latitudinal diversity gradient. And this is basically shown here uh, by, by looking at the high diversity areas um, in, towards the tropics and lower diversity areas toward the poles. Um, this map is just showing for, for species richness um, for um, across those regions. And so we might expect that because there's a temperature gradient as well, that temperature might be responsible for driving this pattern of biodiversity and, and increased species richness towards tropical regions. And so with a group of postdocs, um, we've tackled this question from a couple different angles. And so our expectation might be that climate is a kind of direct driver of these patterns of biodiversity. And what we did is we used uh, NEON data to, to investigate this a little bit further. And what we found actually is that this relationship is not so clean cut. We're not seeing a relationship that's a direct um, link to climate. So for example, here's a plot um, again of the, the small mammal data in NEON and species richness um, is shown here and it's regressed against minimum temperature of the coldest month, which is a, a way of describing kind of the, the stress or the um, temperature stress that an organism might experience. So here's our temperature axis. And what you can see here is there's really no relationship. It's pretty much a scatter. And so instead we worked to try and understand what might be also explaining this pattern of diversity that we're seeing. And what we did is we relied on species level measurements, in particular body mass, 
uh, with these NEON data. And we found that intraspecific trait variation or the, the variation within species in terms of their body mass can actually be a proxy to help understand the degree of competition among species. And that did a better job explaining biodiversity as a kind of mediating factor from temperature. So here's what we did to figure that out. We, again, used the NEON data where these organisms are collected and then measured in terms of body mass. And we use um, some principles that uh, we understood from, from macroecology that if species are, have similar body sizes, they tend to compete more with each other. They're more similar. And so they just tend to have more uh, degree of competition. Um, and we developed a new overlap statistic to actually measure that using the body size measurements within an ecological community. So if we wanted to look at body mass and measure an, just a mean uh, body mass per individual species here, we don't know a lot about the variation within that species. We're just saying overall, this species has this body mass. But instead, if we um, then try and look at the variation, so using all those individual measurements of those body masses, we can make a distribution for each of those species. If we then look within a community at where these species are co-occurring with each other, we can create these density plots like this. And here we can start to see how, how within a community, you see this different amount of overlap between these two species and these two species and these two species. And the degree of overlap can tell us about the, the amount of competition or niche partitioning that might be going on in this community. If you see an, a case like this, where you have low overlap among the organisms, um, it's evidence that, that competition is probably um, quite important in terms of structuring this community because they're partitioning their body mass uh, individually along this axis. But if you see a case like this, where there's a lot of overlap in their body mass, it means that they're sharing that same niche space. And so potentially competition isn't as important of a driver in structuring this community. And so here are our two hypotheses. Either temperature is a direct link into explaining richness, um, or it's indirectly mediated by this degree of overlap, which we are, are we using uh, from these data, this interspecific trait variation, as, again, as a proxy for the degree of competition. And we did this for all the neon sites. So I'm just gonna show two of them for an example here. So if you go to a colder site like Wisconsin, we found that there's quite a bit of overlap. So this is evidence that competition is less of a factor in structuring this community. And it helps explain why there is lower diversity here. In contrast, when you go to a warmer area, we found that there is indeed niche partitioning going on. They're separating their body masses along this axis pretty well. And again, that helps explain why there's more species um, in this area. So a potential mechanism when we, when we ran these structural equation models shown here um, is that warmer temp temperatures are reducing stressful, meaning cold environments, uh, which in turn promote competition for resources. And so this study um, helps really tie together a lot of um, understanding about what actually might be underlying the mechanisms uh, underlying the latitudinal diversity gradient, that it can't just be this direct link from temperature to diversity. So it's, a, it's basically support for this hypothesis that biotic interactions, in this case competition, are increasing in terms of their importance in structuring communities as you get to lower latitudes. So with that study in mind, we wanted to look a little bit further because we knew that, of course, it's not just interspecific trait variation and temperature that's, in, that's driving these patterns of diversity. It's really a lot of different drivers. So we looked further and tried to identify what some of the other main drivers of diversity might be. And they're shown here on this diagram. And when we think about what might be driving patterns of diversity, it's important to recognize that there's kind of two main classes of drivers that we think about. And those are internal filters. So uh, aspects or factors that are internal to the community. These would be things like biotic interactions, competition, predation, uh, facilitation, but also, um, and that can be represented again by this a variation, uh, intraspecific trait variation, at least to get a degree of competition. So that's what we uh, are trying to get at here uh, as representing biotic interactions. Then there's external filters as well. So these would be things like temperature, precipitation, 
land cover, disturbance, past land use, um, these different drivers. And for the rest of this talk, I'm just going to focus on these two, uh, geodiversity and disturbance regime, which are aspects um, that we've been focusing on more recently. So again, NEON is set up in this really nice design where plots are nested within sites, which are nested in domains. So that allows us to actually quantify the different scales at which these drivers are affecting and explaining the variation in diversity. And so what we might expect is that from a plot to a site scale, so these more local scales, that we might see disturbance history and past land use being a stronger influence on, on niche overlap. So again, this idea of, of shared niche uh, breadth here and therefore uh, biodiversity at these more uh, local scales. But as you switch up to the site to domain scale, so these broader spatial scales, climate, land cover, and geodiversity are potentially gonna have more of an influence on driving the patterns that we see. So those are our hypotheses going forward. And um, I wanna note also that the reason we're focusing on these uh, particular drivers uh, here is the uh, past land use disturbance regime and geodiversity is that these currently don't exist in terms of the, the NEON network um, as far as spatial data layers. And so we're, in addition to just testing the hypotheses we're interested in, we're interested in providing the, these data as a resource to other scientists as well. So let's back up a little bit and talk about what I mean by geodiversity. Um, so geodiversity, like biodiversity, is the variation or, or diversity of abiotic features uh, and processes within Earth's critical zone. And the critical zone is made up of the atmosphere, the lithosphere, the hydrosphere, and the cryosphere. So this can be any kind of kind of abiotic components on Earth's surface that help um, harbor life, essentially. And you can also think about this as the stage upon which life exists. The Nature Conservancy has really adopted this term geodiversity to help um, with its efforts in conserving nature's stage. So this idea that identifying areas that might be high in geodiversity should and should harbor more biodiversity uh, is based on the fact that more uh, heterogeneity in the environment should allow for more niche opportunities, which then should allow for more biodiversity. So this targeting uh, of geodiverse areas may actually help um, in terms of identifying areas for conservation. And we recently argued in a paper that uh, geodiversity should be considered just like biodiversity in terms of its essential aspect to life on Earth. So in addition to uh, generating essential biodiversity variables, we should be thinking about uh, evaluating and uh, categorizing essential geodiversity variables, that this is an inherent part uh, of biodiversity and, and life on Earth. And fortunately, geodiversity can be quantified from remote sensing. So we have a lot of great uh, remotely sensed imagery that's coming online and available now and even more in, in the future that's planned. And so we have a lot of ways to sense what's going on on Earth's surface. And by using different measures and metrics, we might be able to quantify how geodiversity relates to biodiversity. Um, and through a recent working group that I co-led with some of my collaborators, we've really tried to get at this problem in particular, this challenge of figuring out what those relationships are. One thing that we did is we generated an R package called GeoDiv, which allows you to take any image, any uh, pixelated image, and essentially generate a large number of geodiversity metrics. And these are essentially our gradient surface metrics that describe how variable or how heterogeneous um, a given look, uh, section of your image is. And again, that can help quantify the degree of geodiversity that you might be seeing um, in one of these images. So here's an example for Oregon, for elevation. If you had a focal location, maybe this is a, a point observation where you have information on tree uh, diversity and you wanna understand what the, what the geodiversity might be around that site, you can then, uh, create and, and, and quantify geodiversity with all these different metrics at varying radius uh, uh, distances from that site. And so this package basically allows you to, to look at scale dependency, as well as just computing these metrics over these different areas. Um, so we hope it'll be really useful for a lot of um, purposes. And I just wanna illustrate one uh, simple example of how you could use this to quantify whether or not there is scale dependence between geodiversity and biodiversity. 
So we wanted to ask, is it actually scale dependent? Is this relationship scale dependent? Instead of using just a mean value of a pixel, why not look at the variability inherent in that area? Because the, the environment around a focal location where you're thinking about the level of biodiversity is important for filtering. It's important for um, really understanding what species are able to exist there. And so what you might do is take this focal location and then set up these different grains, these different radii um, out from it. And then looking at a, a image in the background of, in this case, elevation, you can start to quantify this level of geodiversity at these different concentric rings. And so we did this for forest inventory analysis data uh, in the Western US, uh, where we had a focal uh, point and then there were different survey locations around it, for example. And first what we did is we decided to set the grain size, this radius around um, which, around this focal location uh, to quantify both gamma diversity species itself uh, in, the, in the trees, that is, um, and then also the variability of elevation. And so for this, we're just using standard deviation as a very simple geodiversity metric. Um, and you can see that as you increase grain size, the, the image is, get, is, is differ. It's different. It's it's um, changing uh, over space because you're aggregating over different uh, greens. But we wanted to see what the, the relationship was between these uh, two measures. So if we look at gamma diversity of trees and relate it to elevation variability, you see that the relationship actually increases as you um, get coarser and coarser in terms of your analysis. So this does suggest that in fact geodiversity is related to biodiversity in a scale dependent way. We did this for alpha, beta, and gamma diversity of these trees. And you can see the relationship here that depending on the, the level of aggregation that you're working with, this relationship is scale dependent. We did um, the same analysis across the United States, but we blocked it by ecoregion because we recognize that different ecoregions probably have very different relationships between the biodiversity inherent in them and also the geodiversity. And for geodiversity, we, we computed these metrics using the geodev R package uh, across a variety of different um, satellite remotely sensed image, images. So for precipitation, for example, as shown in this figure, and then we did it again for all of these different dimensions of diversity to again, see how this is changing depending on how you're using these data. And so, yes, we found that the relationship um, between biodiversity and geodiversity is variable. It depends on ecoregion and it also depends on the different taxonomic group. So here's for trees, here's for birds using the North American Breeding Birds Survey. And uh, this paper has a lot more information in terms of the other geodiversity metrics as well. The point being, it's really variable. And so being really particular and, and um, uh, explanatory about why you're choosing different ways of aggregating your data, the scales at which you're actually using these drivers is really important, um, both for fundamental questions about what's driving patterns of biodiversity, but also for parameterizing these models that might be predicting future or current distributions and range shifts. Scale really matters. All right, so getting back to um, the drivers of biodiversity, the next part of the talk, I'm just gonna quickly go over the disturbance regime and why that is a particularly important um, aspect to get a handle on. So disturbance um, you know, occurs across all types of landscapes, all types of systems, and it's different in terms of its frequency, its intensity, and, and its severity. It's also gonna be different depending on what organisms are experiencing it. Um, and so we wanted to develop a way to detect and attribute disturbances across um, the lower 48 um, to, to match this up then with the NEON data that we're observing. Um, and uh, some work by Annie Smith, um, a, a former postdoc in my lab, really found that, that spatial, um, using spatial information, so the, the amount of information about local and, and close by disturbances can actually help improve detection and attribution of a disturbance in any given location. And so um, working with Annie and also Jasper Van, Van Donink, who is a current postdoc in my lab, we're developing this workflow to use Google Earth Engine and the land trender algorithm, which essentially compiles a lot of um, time series information from Landsat imagery uh, 
um, which detects uh, different land use uh, types across uh, Earth's surface and reflectance values. Um, to basically build a time series to look at how disturbance uh, could be detected and attributed across uh, continuously across the United States. And so for every given time series that we see here in every pixel, um, and this is at 30 meter resolution, we're breaking down the time series uh, this way. So the time series starts in 1984 and it ends in 2020. And we can detect when a disturbance occurs based on the spectral index change. So how the reflectance value in the pixel is actually changing. You go from a, a, a primary forest to a clear cut, that's a major change in the reflectance value, the spectral index of that pixel. So we can detect that at every single pixel, pixel across this entire region. And so for each of these time series and, and each pixel, we're starting to build models that the can actually identify the disturbance and attribute it to a certain type of disturbance. And to get at that, we need to have a bunch of parameters. So things like magnitude, rate of change, and the duration of the disturbance. We then take these parameters and we use the spatial information around the focal pixel to help uh, improve detection of the, of the disturbance. So for example, here, if we have a focal pixel, we would use the information around the pixel to say, yeah, we're pretty sure in this case that this pixel is actually disturbed because a lot of the disturbance around it is. Whereas in this case, not much of the disturbance around it uh, is happening. And so we are likely to say that this is no disturbance. Um, and this is done with some um, random forest models that, we're, that we run on these. And then we can do the same thing for attribution. So telling what type of disturbance it is, using information around the focal pixel to say, yeah, we think this is probably a clear cut because so much of it around it is, is also disturbed in this way and it's clear cut versus maybe it's biotic uh, in terms of maybe an insect uh, disturbance, a, a, a single tree or a single uh, patch that, that's um, uh, being killed off by an insect. So we can sort of start to tease apart what types of disturbances there might be as well using the spatial information. And all together, uh, eventually, this will become a wall-to-wall -wall product uh, at 30 meter resolution across the US, where it tells you about what the disturbance is, how frequently it occurred, the magnitude of that disturbance. Um, and so that's you know, kind of the end goal. And we're sort of in the beginning stages of working through this uh, process now. This is just a um, alluvial plot to show you by different major land use types uh, what the disturbances are across the United States that we're picking up on. So for example, forested uh, areas uh, experience disturbance in, in a variety of ways, but the most common of course is, is harvest. Um, there's also mechanical um, structural decline in the forest as well. So we can start to make these nice um, relationships and, and learn a lot about what the disturbance is and what the frequency of these disturbances are by different land use types. Now related to this, it's also easier to detect some types of disturbance than others. So for example, forests, we're, we're doing pretty well in terms of the land use type of forest, uh, in terms of identifying the types of disturbances that occur. This also has somewhat to do with the fact that we have many more um, training data. So on the ground observations of when a plot is disturbed and we can relate that then to uh, within the model itself. And so we're working on fine tuning the ability to detect better and attribute better um, by different land use types. So for example, rangeland does pretty poorly. We're working now to try and um, identify ways to improve that, those models that detect and attribute uh, disturbances in rangelands. And I just wanna show you some uh, initial very preliminary results from some simple models that we've been running to, uh, to then connect up this disturbance information with the biodiversity that we're observing at these neon sites. So for each neon site, we uh, took information on the, the species richness. We're not, we're eventually gonna do all of the different types of uh, diversity. So different dimensions of diversity, but for now we're focusing on uh, site level species richness, looking at trees, birds, small mammals, other plants, uh, beetles and mosquitoes. And we ran with generalized linear models, uh, a baseline model, which looked at mean annual temperature, mean annual precipitation, terrain ruggedness index, which is a, a way of describing geodiversity as well as elevation. 
We then compared those models with disturbance models, the models that contained those baseline variables, but also contained a disturbance metric for every spatial and temporal scale combination uh, that we could actually compute disturbance. And what I mean by that is that uh, if you're detecting and attributing disturbance, you can do that across different windows of time. It could be just the last five years. It could be up to 20 years in the past. So that temporal scale has a really big influence as well. In addition, as, we, uh, as I showed with the geodiversity measures, you can build concentric rings around your focal location. So detecting and attributing disturbance can be scale dependent as well in terms of spatial scale. So we're exploring these different methods for how to actually quantify the scale dependency um, of those temporal and spatial windows over which you uh, are building disturbance or identifying and quantifying it. Um, and so we had 12 disturbance models in total. And then we looked um, at the, the two best models um, from, all, from all of these together to identify which ones rose to the top. And this is just an image here showing what I mean by looking at these concentric rings around a, a given um, uh, neon site. So here's the Yellowstone Northern Range. Here's the Bartlett Experimental Forest. And you can have these different concentric rings over which you're inferring information about the disturbance that's going on. You can have these different temporal scales going back five years, 10 years in the past, 20 years in the past, um, because certainly disturbance can have a different influence depending on its temporal uh, time frame and, and, and also the organism's uh, generation time, for example. So this um, plot just shows um, some of the key model results summed up. And what you're looking at here is a spatial scale of disturbance. So kind of those concentric rings going out from the site all the way out to a 25 kilometer radius over which we're trying to infer disturbance uh, as the driver. And then um, also five years to 20 years in the past for disturbance. And the way to read this is to look at um, models that were ranked first and second. So some of the top models that, that appeared are shown here. And then if it's a negative response in terms of this disturbance effect, um, it's shown in red and positive in blue. And what you'll see is that models in general, including disturbance, tended to outperform models that just, just relied on baseline information. So no disturbance information at all. So that is um, suggesting that disturbance is indeed an important factor in explaining patterns of diversity across these scales and taxa. <clears throat> but that if you look here, the more local models um, that you're seeing, so more local spatial scale and more local temporal scale, so looking uh, more recently in the past in terms of disturbance, those, uh, when we included variables of disturbance in those more local scales, those tended to perform better than the ones that were farther out in the past. Now there are some exceptions with trees. So for example, trees are long lived. And so, you know, there may be a longer um, influence of disturbance in the past in terms of inferring today's biodiversity patterns of trees. So these are pretty recent results. We're still teasing them apart, um, but we're really excited to see that disturbance does seem to be making a difference. And we're excited to kind of delve into this more by taxonomic group. So in closing, I just want to talk about some of the main outcomes of the search, which I'll emphasize is in progress. And so we don't have a lot um, of these final products ready to go. But our hope is that we will be producing comp computational workflows, but also data products that other scientists can use, both in terms of explaining patterns of diversity, of diversity across these different scales and the drivers that are acting on that, but also in terms of how do you actually attribute disturbance and how do you detect it across um, different uh, spatial scales? And so that's, that's another um, important uh, contribution. And finally, the, together, those will be creating this 30 meter disturbance layer, um, layers uh, for every year across this time frame, um, both in terms of the frequency, severity, magnitude of the disturbances, but also the different types of disturbances. So these will be products that we hope to roll out within the next year. And then my collaborator, Sydney Record, is heading up um, our team's uh, efforts to produce land use history that's geospatially referenced um, across each neon site using a lot of LIDAR imagery. Um, so getting really that kind of fine scale, very local land use history um, information. 
And uh, because a lot of the work that's done at NEON uh, focuses on many different taxa and, and measuring a lot of different things, there are, there are some measurements that they're just not able to do because it's just, there's a lot uh, there to measure. And so we're gonna be helping to measure um, more measurements of the ground beetles, which are an indicator species, to try and get at multi-dimensional trait space. So instead of focusing just on body mass, we're interested in looking at multiple dimensions, multiple traits, and how that feeds into understanding um, this interspecific trait variation that we're trying to get at. And then finally, a couple of outreach and teaching uh, uh, products are going to be modules uh, for students, um, both on the data and interpreting kind of fundamental patterns in ecology, but also on data skills uh, through data science uh, work. And then uh, we're really excited to be developing an interactive science in the sphere module. Um, these science on the spheres are literally a sphere that are projecting um, images across, uh, all, across the globe or any kind of spherical object. And we're excited to be developing one module that could exist in museums uh, really anywhere uh, that has a sphere. And that really emphasizes the importance of networked data, how scientists work together as a team to, to leverage data just across the globe or across a large region to um, really understand more fundamentally what might be driving, in this case, patterns of biodiversity. And with that, um, I just want to thank, uh, in addition to the collaborators I listed on the first slide, I have many other collaborators. Um, I want to highlight especially here uh, several undergraduates that have been really essential in uh, this team effort and have been a real joy to work with. Um, we have uh, also this website you can check out if you want to learn more about our project. Um, the Climate Intervention uh, website is listed here as well. And then we have some resources on GitHub. And with that, I can take some questions. Thank you. Thank you for that great talk. And I will remind everyone, please, if you have questions, put them in the Q&A. If we do not get to them all today, um, we will be sending that list on to Dr. Zanetsky and your name, however you have it um, listed here, will be shown on that. Um, we do have several questions there. Let's see. Um, if and several of them have come in kind of throughout the talk, so I'm going to try to interpret when I think uh, they're they're referencing. So, have you thought about extending to celestial scales, for example, solar flares, northern lights, interaction with ozone holes, etc.? Wow, that's a I haven't thought about that. That's a really interesting question. Um, I think most of the macro systems work I've been focusing on is up to the continental and, and sometimes global scale. Um, but that's, I think, definitely something of interest. And, I, and also with my um, recent, more recent collaborations with climate scientists, um, that might be an interesting avenue to explore. So I haven't thought about it, but it seems really intriguing. And, and how are you handling non-native species? And, and are you thinking about non-native species in your analyses? That's a really good question. Um, so yeah, when the analyses that I presented today exclude the non-native species in some cases, but include them in others. So it's, it really depends on the question. If we want to try to understand um, from a biogeographic context or macroecological context, what is explaining patterns of diversity that we see today, then we might in some cases want to be looking at including those invasive species. If we want to understand uh, what might be explaining you know, endemic patterns of diversity, we would separate those out. And so there's actually other ways that we partition out those data. So I, I, I mentioned small mammals. Well, the traps that are set up by NEON are really geared toward focusing on nocturnal rodents, but of course there's bycatch. So sometimes there are chipmunks that pop in there. Um, sometimes uh, other, other animals, like even skunks that, that occur. And so they're not small mammals, but they're kind of, they might get caught up in, in the traps. And so when we're asking a question about a fundamental relationship between species that are co-occurring and potentially interacting, we're really careful to focus on the species that we know from natural history should really be interacting more, should be sharing the resources more. So in that first example I gave with the small mammal uh, analysis, we excluded anything that was not a rodent uh, because their diet breath is, is you know, fundamentally different. Um, and, and their way of, way of interacting and their body size is, is also sometimes quite different. 
Um, so for example, we uh, excluded shrews from that because they tend to be more insectivorous. Great. Um, okay, so, okay. So um, the, let's see, we have theory suggests that predators can vary in their impacts on beta diversity based on whether they're generalists uh, or specialists. And has your work on consumption, consumption rates given any insight into whether higher temperatures and metabolic rates can alter generalist impacts on diversity to be more deterministic? Oh, that's a great question. Um, so our experimental work has, has really focused on community modules that tend to be quite small because um, it just ends up being really difficult to manipulate multiple you know, many, many species in a controlled environment with, with affecting temperature as well. And so we haven't actually, from an experimental point of view, uh, looked at generalists versus specialists in particularly. So a lot of the times we're looking at two, maybe three interacting species to try to get a handle on how those interactions are shaped by uh, temperature. Um, but I think it's a really good question and something that you that we could look at uh, by leveraging some of these broader data sets. So maybe not from an experimental point of view, but looking into the literature about what has been seen over um, longer time series, for example, there's this really great um, data set that's now available called BioTime, which compiles a lot of long-term data uh, at the community level across the world, um, kind of you know, leveraging all of these different locations and, and time series. So that might be a place where we can use observational data, not experimental, but uh, to look at how these, these different um, predators, you know, generalists versus specialists might be responding to inherent changes in the environment and inherent changes in the biotic uh, community as well. So haven't looked at that specifically, but I think it's a great question. Um, so here's a question. What is the most surprising discovery so far in your research? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, I think, I think that maybe it's not so surprising, but I, it is surprising to me how context matters over and over again. Um, so the scale at which we are aggregating data, the, the groups of organisms that we're looking at, everything is very different, but then there are these fundamental overlying kind of relationships that we draw on in ecology, these, these sort of general rules that we keep trying to find and, and find support for. And I think what's been maybe surprising to me is that in some cases, I, I'm surprised by seeing some of the relationships actually uh, aligning with these broader gradients or broader uh, expectations, like with that small mammal paper uh, with the neon data. I was kind of surprised to see that we saw evidence for interspecific trait variation really shining through as a way to explain this variation uh, in diversity. Um, but then when I switched to looking at the context dependency of the scale and the ecoregion and the impact of or the relationship between biodiversity and geodiversity, it always comes back to understanding the inherent natural history of the organism, um, the location you're in. And so it's, I think we're farther away from having this sort of overarching general framework um, in a lot of ways, but then in then I keep getting surprised that I see some, you know, high support for uh, these relationships when we kind of zoom into one taxonomic group, for example, or one system. So I think um, that just is a long way of saying the context matters, natural history matters. And I keep coming back to that as a way of trying to understand sometimes very messy results. <laughs> Thanks. So I'm gonna do one last question. Um, Several more have come in. So maybe, okay. So first one, is anyone looking into various molds and their evolution and how they affect the environment, including but not limited to plants and animals? Um, so like spores, like molds in the environment? Is that what that? I think, yeah. So so they're looking for information on if anyone's doing similar research, but on, on molds and... Yeah, um, I'm not aware of it. Um, I mean, I think what is sometimes a shame in conservation is that, I mean, it's not a shame, but it's a lot of the taxa that are focused on are tend to be charismatic. They're birds, they're mammals, they're reptiles, amphibians, 
and there's and plants, um, but there's a lot more to the tree of life. And um, I think that that's this question is actually a really great example of how I don't know. Uh, and I think that probably it's not being done to the extent that it should be. Part of the problem there is that we just don't have enough observational data on a lot, a lot of other taxonomic groups aside from these more charismatic ones. And so that's a really big data gap um, that needs to be filled. Um, certainly if we think about you know, the total number of species on earth being maybe 13 million, a lot of that's gonna be made up of these other organisms that, that we just don't study as much um, and that we just haven't really delved into. I mean, soil microbiota, the organisms in the soil are just now being able to, to be quantified through genomic techniques and other methods. So I think, you know, with molds and other, other uh, parts of the tree of life, that that's something where we need to delve into that more. And I think we'll just continually be um, surprised and sort of astounded by the amount of diversity that's out there um, if we start to pursue that research more. I think that is a, a great place to end. Um, and and uh, we will, as, as I said before, be sending um, Dr. Zarnetsky a copy of, of the questions. And hopefully uh, some of the, the folks from Cary will have a chance to meet with you and ask questions directly and follow up on, on some of the more details, detailed uh, questions about your work. But thank you so much for joining us today and, and for delivering a really insightful and exciting uh, talk about your research. Thank you. Thanks, Shannon. Thanks to everyone.